You're listening to the LA Football Podcast. What's going on, Los Angeles? What's up, Bolt fam? Welcome to the LA Football Show. This is your Chargers edition of the LA Football Podcast. Excited to get into it today because we have huge breaking news. The Los Angeles Chargers have officially hired an offensive coordinator, former Dallas Cowboys offensive coordinator Kellen Moore is coming to LA. They pounced on it quick. So we are going to give our thoughts on that. I'm your co-host Ryan Dyru, joined by the great Jamal Madney. What's up, brother? Happy Monday. How was the weekend? Happy Monday to you, Ryan. Great weekend. Opportunity for a little bit of R and R. And you know, you come back from a little bit of a of an out-of-town getaway, and you're ready on Monday to talk about the noise made by the Chargers. It feels like we can't go more than 48 or 72 hours without the Chargers making some noise one way or the other, and they certainly didn't disappoint today. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a in terms of content to get off season so far for both the Rams and Chargers, because we've had plenty to talk about, even with their seasons being done, the Rams season being done for, you know, what feels like six months already. And we still have at least stuff for them. And the Chargers obviously have had a lot of stuff as well. So show is always brought online.ag today use our promo code believe that's b l e a v gives you a 50 percent welcome bonus on your first deposit super bowl obviously now is just two weeks away and that is probably the best sporting event to bet on just because there is so much and you can do it all at bet online get some player props going get your over-unders for the national anthem going get your what's the gatorade color going to be going all that at betonline.ag promo code believe make sure you use that so you get uh some free money on your first deposit so all right well we want to hear from you kellen moore i feel like the fan base at least from what i've seen it's been a busy day but from what i've seen everyone seems fairly happy about this move um jamal we haven't even talked at all so i'm excited that we're just kind of going into this raw getting your thoughts because we didn't really touch on it even pre-air or even texting earlier. So, um, but I think overall the the fan base in general likes the move. It's a big name, which everyone wanted. It's a guy that's called plays, which everyone wanted. It's not a cheap route, which everyone wanted. Um, so we will get into all that, but we do want to hear from you. So text bolts, the words, the word bolts, B O L T S to three, one zero three, two, and let us know your thoughts on the hire, or you can just hit us up on Twitter at Ryan Dyer LAFB or at LAFB Jans. But Jamal, let me kick it to you since we haven't talked. Thoughts, how are you feeling about this move? Kellen Moore to the Bolts. I really like it, Ryan. I think it was a slam dunk hire for the Chargers. And there's a couple things that come to mind for me. The first is it really shows how poor the candidate pool was pre-Kellen Moore. I know you and I talked about it on air with some of those options But that just felt like going to the thrift shop, honestly, Uh, in terms of the names that we were talking about seven days ago, eight days ago, 10 days ago. And so the fact that they were able to pull the trigger on a name that was out of work for less than 24 hours, A, you have to commend the Chargers for being so aggressive and opportunistic and knowing that this was really a key opportunity, and B, you really have to understand that what they were dealing with before Kellen Moore was a significant downgrade. The second thing that comes to mind for me, Ryan, is just this was one of the hottest names in football as a head coach two years ago, three years ago, and is also undisputed one of the most productive offensive coordinators of the last four years. When you look at the Dallas Cowboys offense, in terms of points scored, in terms of total yards, in terms of first downs. This was a top three offense across all of those key factors. And so now you bring Kellen Moore over from a Dak Prescott to a Justin Herbert, and you're going from a guy who had the highest interception percentage rate in Dak Prescott at 3.8%, to a guy like Justin Herbert, sixth lowest interception rate per 100 passes at 1.7%. And now you're able to sort of unlock potentially Kellen Moore's abilities with a much more upgraded quarterback in this incredibly talented skill position group that is complementing Justin Herbert. So I'm very excited about that. 
And I think the last piece of the puzzle now, Ryan, is it's definitely put up or shut up time for Brandon Staley. There's no more excuses because you have a top flight offensive coordinator. You are the guru on the defensive side of the ball. We've acknowledged that this is a top five offense and team from a roster construction perspective. You've gone from nine and eight year one to 10 and seven year two. I mean, it really is. If they're not competing tooth and nail for a division title, if they're not making the playoffs and if they're not winning at least one game in the playoffs, this is probably 2023 is probably going to be Brandon Staley's last year on the job. So it's, it's put up or shut up time for Staley as well. Those are my big takeaways, but I'm very excited. The Chargers finally went away from just plucking off of the Rams coaching tree or going with a low budget hire. Kellen Moore being the name that he is coming from Dallas. I think this is now setting up the Chargers for success moving forward. And I'm really excited about their mentality Ryan, of thinking of themselves more as an L.A. team and not just as a San Diego team. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So my few big takeaways before we get into kind of the the nitty gritty of it is, one, it it tells me kind of as you alluded to, when you look at the pool of who they interviewed and then this is what they get, it's like such an upgrade. Um, And I think that tells me that, A, they were truly waiting on maybe Bobby Slowick with the Niners, maybe Brian Johnson with the Eagles. They're waiting for one of those guys still in the playoffs, someone with the Bengals staff. So I think that was kind of more what they were going to go for. Um, Cause obviously a lot of these hires you interview. And if, if you love the interview, you make the hire right away. I mean, Brandon Staley was hired pretty quickly as head coach after he interviewed with Spanos and Telesco, you know, two years ago. And that happens with um, OC candidates. So that tells me that they were waiting for one of those guys. And when this happened, they were able to pluck two I don't know. I didn't do too much digging on it. I saw a report that the Chargers had actually talked to Kellen Moore before it was ever officially announced that he and the Cowboys had parted ways. They received permission from the Cowboys. They had, I don't know if it was an official interview or just talked and engaged each other's interest. So it was kind of, I, I thought it was kind of, um, how do I say this? A Hollywood-esque move that they kind of smoke screened the fans six unbeknownst names and then they're able to behind the scenes behind the curtain kind of have some talks with the big name guy and as soon as he's freed up everyone's thinking he's going to tampa and guess what he's come to la and it's kind of funny because the last big name person to be going between tampa and la was tom brady if you remember right before justin herbert was drafted he chose tampa and now kellen moore who is linked to tampa chooses la so um that was kind of some takeaways the other takeaway and this is before even getting to x's and o's and what he's gonna do for the offense is we talked before lombardi was fired at the end of the season we talked about like what we would do if we were ownership and how we love staley but we thought you know in la you need to make a splash to get the fan base whether it's even if it's right or wrong x's and o's wise like you gotta have that high profile big name um they ended up firing the offensive guys. They kept Staley, which I was totally fine with overall because I think he's a good football coach. But now they get that splash name. Just happens to be a coordinator. But like you said, he was one of the hottest head coaching names in his cycle just two years ago. Uh, He's done some really, really fun things on offense, some great play calling, you know, some stuff I don't love, but is that McCarthy kind of like hierarching over him? Who knows? Some stuff I do love. We saw him be able to win football games with Cooper Rush as quarterback. We saw him get really um, balanced in the run game with both Tony Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott. And and so here's a guy that, you know, has that pedigree, which is what we wanted, has the name recognition, which is what we wanted, came from a big football market, which is what we wanted, and brings it all here to L.A. So to me, when you're looking at offensive coordinators, this is about as slam dunk as you can get Jamal. So, you know, well, we'll get into football right now, obviously, about it. But when it comes to just the pure hire on the surface level, less than 24 hours of it happening, like this is an, an absolute slam dunk hire, I think. Yeah, right. I mean, for sure. I mean, for all the reasons that you've laid out and now moving forward, I think what I'm very excited about is how he can take this team that was allergic to running the football <laughs> and how can he bring that sense of balance to this offense where the pressure isn't so much on Justin Herbert and some of the the lateral concepts 
that Joe Lombardi brought to the table. I think I was most impressed, Ryan, you alluded to it, is when Cooper Rush was the quarterback of the Cowboys this year. They came into L.A., they stomped the Rams, they had some very good performances. They were undefeated, really- right? Absolutely. Yeah. They were undefeated. And so their their ability to just turn around, hand the ball off to Zeke, to Pollard, do the play action, still find ways to get Des Bryant the ball in these sort of, you know, fewer and further between key situations. I thought he did a great job calling the plays when the game was compact with Cooper Rush, when you didn't, you weren't able to stretch things vertically, when the game was played in the box, the game was played in between the hash marks. And then obviously you love what he brought to the table with Dak Prescott in this more wide open style of offense, got the tight end involved a lot. There's very unique things that he does with bunch formations, with pace, with motion, with balance. I mean, these are all the things that you're looking for to keep a defense off balance, to continuously put that pressure and alleviate your own defense from having to play a perfect game. So I just think he's a very novel mind. And I think that he comes from a similar pedigree of some of the best coaches and offensive minds around. I mean, he was, everyone forgets, he was the winningest quarterback in the history of college football at Boise State and really didn't have an elite arm, didn't really have elite athleticism. And that awareness of what worked and what didn't from his college days is really what the foundation was for him building his mind as what makes offenses tick, much in the same way you saw with Zach Taylor in Cincinnati. Zach Taylor was a quarterback at Nebraska. Learn how to move the ball in key situations for a big program with limitations athletically and arm-wise. And it's these guys that have played the game at the highest level or near at the highest level as starting quarterbacks, but understand the things that they could do and not do really is the ultimate education to be a great offensive coordinator and a great, great head football coach. And so that's why I'm really excited. I also love the fact that age wise, he's not that far removed from Justin Herbert. He's sitting at around 34 years old. Herbert's 25. When you look at McVay and Stafford, they're only a couple years difference from one another. This is a little bit more than that, but I think having that relatability in age, at least being closer, I think that's going to help a lot in terms of relationship building between offensive coordinator and quarterback, build trust in key moments. So I think this hits really everything that you wanted if you were a Chargers fan. It shows a seriousness about winning. It shows an urgency about the window of opportunity that they are in right now. And it shows that they're not content with just being a nine or a 10 win team, that they understand that to be truly elite in the AFC and join the likes of Kansas city and Cincinnati and Buffalo, they needed to upgrade. And they've certainly done that. Yeah. You know, you just look at the, the trend in the NFL of coaches and you mentioned Zach Taylor, you got Kevin O'Connell, former quarterback, obviously Frank Reich, former quarterback, Kellen Moore, former quarterback. It's these guys that were like, up clipboard carrying quarterbacks they were very cerebral but just didn't quite have the talent to be that starter level but that's what makes good coaches right I mean the whole whatever you if you believe it or not but the saying goes like if you can't if you can't play it teach it or whatever right and that's what we're seeing now with these guys and you know I love for those that don't know Kellen Moore's trajectory to coaching is is a super fun one literally was a backup slash third stringer on the Cowboys up until 2017 and then in 2018, he became a core rack coach. Like literally went from backup QB to QB coach within one year on the team that he was on. So I thought that was super cool. And then rose the ranks quickly under Jason Garrett and then was kept on the staff from Mike McCarthy, uh, obviously, to BOC there. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Before we – I got it like a question um, from someone on Twitter that we can get into. Before we do that, I was just curious your thoughts on this because – I don't think with this hire, a lot of fans are thinking this, but it does happen a lot when a coach gets fired or whatever, they're kind of seen as like damaged goods a little bit or like, Oh man, maybe they need some time off or we don't want them to come to our team first and be the rebound because obviously they were fired for a reason. Now with the Cowboys and they, I'm not saying he was perfect by any means. There were some games where I didn't, I remember watching and I'm like, okay, you have like, what are you doing here? Like, why are we, why are we having Dak throw it 51 times or whatever? Uh, some of what we saw Joe Lombardi in that regard. But overall, I think he was a great OC. It felt like 
he was just kind of the scapegoat there. And, you know, Dak's making 42 million or whatever a year. They're not moving on from Dak. I think Dak is a good quarterback. I don't think he's a great quarterback. He has limitations and you can only kind of go so far, but they're not moving on from him. Didn't want to fire Mike McCarthy. That's Jerry Jones's, whatever you want to do. That's, that's on him. So to me, it felt like he was just kind of the scapegoat of like, we need to try something new. Did you feel that? Or do you think there was a disconnect there? Or do you think it was a rightful fire? Or is it more of a, this is really just a benefit for the Chargers because the Cowboys just used him as a fall on? I think the Cowboys were in a very similar position as the Chargers, that they knew that they needed to make a move because they stalled out in the playoffs two consecutive years. It felt like they hit their ceiling and they knew they couldn't bring this core back of players and coaches and just re-up again. And I think, Ryan, you said it best. When you look at what's out there, you're paying Dak $42 million. You can't move on from him. McCarthy is still only going into year three. And I think Jerry Jones wants to shed the moniker that he just wants to go through coaches. He actually is very loyal to his coaches. Jason Garrett was one of the longest yeah. tenured coaches in the NFL. He coached for the Cowboys <laughs> for a decade, which is an eternity in the NFL. So when you go down the list and you say, well, who's left? It was Kellen Moore, and Kellen Moore was the odd man out. And the Cowboys did not have a Kellen Moore problem. The Cowboys have a Dak Prescott problem. Dak Prescott is not an elite quarterback. Dak Prescott is a top 15 quarterback, and the problem is you're paying him like a top five quarterback, and that's the Cowboys' problem. That's going to be their undoing for the next several years until they either realize that or are willing to swallow it or have the fortitude to move on from Dak. But – this was not a situation that Kellen Moore was the problem in any way, shape, or form. It's you've invested in the wrong quarterback, but you're so far in, it's a sunk cost phenomena. And I think the, char the, the Cowboys' loss is the Chargers' gain. Now Kellen Moore comes in with, I think, a better quarterback. I think most people would agree that, that Justin Herbert is significantly better than Dak Prescott. And I think you inherit a better wide receiver room than you had in Dallas. I think Des Bryant is better than anyone. CD Lamb. Uh, I mean, I mean uh, CD Lamb, sorry. Des was good. Des was good back in the day. Is better than anyone on the Chargers by far uh, from a wide receiver perspective. But when you put the whole group together, I think the Chargers unit is, is significantly better than the Cowboys unit. And let's see what he can do now with this running game and whether he's going to push management to maybe draft a running back a little bit higher in the draft to really sort of be able to play with all his toys. Well, I think now you, and what well, we can just get, I think now you have to, right? When you see what yeah. they did with Zeke and Pollard and having that one, two punch and you go down the last, really all of last season. I mean, they were pretty split almost every game, like 15, 15, as close to that as you could, like yeah. 17 to 13 or 16 to 14. Like they really were your thunder lightning, if you will. And, you know, the Chargers have those different styles right now, but whether it's lack of talent or was whether it was just Lombardi not utilizing, they didn't do that. And so this now it's their force to either, hey, do we trust this group of running backs or do we go get someone in that first round or second round that can be our thunder to – you know, Austin Eckler's lightning and not make Austin Eckler run the ball <clears throat> 18, 19 times, let him run it seven, eight, nine times, let the other guy run it seven, eight, nine, 10 times and really have a nice one, two punch. So that's what we've been wanting, Jamal. So maybe now this hire will force that hand. Um, and, I'm and yeah, sure just to go. Right if Austin Eckler is the lightning. <laughs> I think, I think you have a problem if Austin Eckler is your lightning. Uh, so, but, but I, I hear you in terms of the duo. I think you need some fresh legs in there to, to really sort of jolt this two-back system where Eckler can kind of play more of the role of Zeke, where he's more of that third-down specialist, that short-yarded specialist, and then you can do some interesting things with him in the red zone, for sure. Yeah, and pass catching and and in space and whatnot. So, um, But I also, going back to what you are saying with, with him and what I was asking about with Kellen Moore kind of being the scapegoat, you know, I watched, I'll be honest, the boys game out there, but you know, you watch a good amount. They seem to be on prime time all the damn time. So, so you see enough of them a little bit, but if Joe Lombardi was holding Justin Herbert back, it felt like Kellen Moore was elevating Dak Prescott. And we maybe saw the best of what we could see of Dak again, not week over week. It was never perfect, but we, I think 
Dak got that contract in part because of a having a great offensive line, B having a great running game that he could lean on. And then C obviously Dak puts in a lot of work. I'm not taking anything away from him. He's a great guy, great uh, leader and great man of character and puts in the work to go out there. But I don't think, I don't think anyone else is going to get more than maybe what we saw Kel Moore. So that should be exciting for chargers fans that now hopefully we can see that elevate Justin Herbert to, we know he can get it done with the arm talent. We know statistically he's been great every year, but now can the play calling match up with that talent to now lead to more dominant offensive play and more consistent offensive play. And so the question now that I was asked by um, his name at, what is it at ghost? I believe at, at ghost was, um, you know, they were talking in the press conference, yeah, they was, and it was, I can't remember if he flat out said it or just alluded to it, but they were going to kind of look, obviously it showed that way by based on who they interviewed too, but they were kind of looking for an offense to model around that Shanahan McVay system. So the question was, does Kellen Moore fit what they were looking for of that Shanahan and McVay ilk in your opinion? I think so, because I think that the, the characteristic that really defines both McVay and Shanahan is variety. And it's through variety that you create uneasiness on the defense, that you create mystery, that you create matchup problems, that you disguise the things that you really want to do. And I think Kellen Moore brings a tremendous amount of variety to the table. And I completely agree with you, Ryan. I think that Kellen Moore elevated Dak Prescott to be a max quarterback when maybe the tool set wasn't really there in the same way it is with these top five guys. So with that, what is he going to do with a talent like Justin Herbert? And I think it's a big year for Herbert too. I alluded to Brandon Staley really in a, in a put up or shut up type of year, but this is a year now where we expect great things from Herbert. Herbert needs to be in the top three, four of candidates for the 2023 NFL MVP, because given his talent, given what's around him and now given what's such a great offensive coordinator, there's really no excuses for Justin Herbert anymore either. And so I think the fan base now has to sort of treat him as of, hey, these are our expectations of you and let's go make it happen. But to go back to the answer, Ryan, I do think Moore is is in that same ilk. I think he's young. I think he's innovative. He's willing to think outside the box. Like I mentioned, it's different formations. He'll beat you throwing the ball 55 times. He can beat you running the ball 35 times. He can beat you with a tight end. He can beat you with a stack of receivers. There's just so much variety that Kellen Moore brings to the table. And what I really like about Kellen Moore, which is a characteristic that I think is rare in coaching nowadays, is he fits his strategy to his personnel. He doesn't force a strategy on a personnel. And I think a great example of this is what's happening in Philadelphia where you see that the way the Eagles design their offense, it's we're going to throw it short, we're going to throw it really long, and we're going to run the ball and and run that zone read. We're going to take the intermediate pass game really out of the equation because that's not Jalen Hurts' skill set and strength. And look, it's taken them to a number one seed in the Super Bowl. So what I love about Kellen Moore is he's not attached to one concept, one principle, and forces the personnel to work around the strategy He changes, evolves, and his strategy is malleable to his personnel. And I think that's why he's been successful year in and year out over the last four years. Yeah, and I'm really curious to see. So his whole tenure with the Cowboys, he was underneath offensive-minded head coaches. Now, some could say, well, that benefits him because you have someone else in the room, but some could, you could also make the argument that that could almost handicap him in a way because he didn't have full control, full reins of, yes, he was the play caller, but he still has the head guy who's the offensive-minded guy overseeing it, can over, like veto things and install different things to open the game up. And so now we can really see like this, this is his baby now. Like He's been given the keys to a Ferrari in this offense, in this Justin Herbert, and obviously Brandon Staley has some offensive background. He's talked many times. He's he's going to be involved. He has been involved thus far as a head coach. But but now this also allows hopefully, you know, Staley to really just focus on the defense. And I know that was the plan anyway with Lombardi. Obviously, it didn't work out. But now hopefully, with the success that Moore's had previously, with the amount of years he's been a play caller already in his young age. 
the brand so they can have full confidence say, okay, now I can make this defense a top five unit. You make the offense a top five unit and we're ready to rock and roll and make this thing a great season in 2023. So got a question for you, Jamal. I'm going to put you on the spot. So I can answer first if you need to think. So just tell me right when I ask it, you say, okay, give me a minute. Outside of Justin Herbert, who is the player on offense that this hire benefits most? So who can we see potentially make the biggest jump from 2022 to 2023 going from Joe Lombardi calling plays and installing the offense to Kellen Moore calling the plays and installing the offense? Ooh, that's a good question. You can go first really if you need to think. I, I think it's going to be Gerald Everett. Oh, are I you think, kidding me? That was mine. <laughs> I think it's going to be Everett. I think we're going to see a huge jump in Gerald Everett in terms of receiving down the field, in terms of how he's going to stack with different receivers, where he's going to line up. I think we could see Everett line up in the backfield a little bit. I think we're going to see him with the receivers a little bit, more in a traditional tight end formation a little bit. I think we're going to see him outside, down the field, I, I think it's really going to open up because when you look at how Kellen Moore has used tight ends in Dallas in the past off of misdirection, play action, it's just been such a big part of the offense that I think Gerald Everett's going to make a huge jump. Look, we know what Keenan Allen can do. He's, he's superior. He's sensational. We know Mike Williams, what he can do. But I think both of those guys have sort of maxed out their ability. Like they are who they are and they're great, but they are who they are. I think Eckler has kind of maxed out his ability. We kind of know who he is. Everett is that one toy, A, because he's so versatile with his body and his skill set, and B, I still feel like he's scratching the surface of what he can be and with the right coordinator who has kind of tight end-oriented thinking in mind. I think Gerald Everett's going to really break out in 23. Well, I mean, yeah, great minds think alike because that was mine. Um, Just seeing what – Dallas and Moore has done with Dalton Schultz and some of these other exactly. lesser known tight ends that have kind of broken onto the scene. And so I, I'm really excited to see what he does with Gerald Everett and Donald Parham and just all, Trey McKitty, all the tight ends in general. But, um, but Everett was mine. That's like, Oh man, he's going to have, and Everett had a great year this year, but now we can really see him get used in space more and do a lot of things. So I'll answer differently. And um, we've talked about him, but I'll, I'll go Austin Eckler because I think, what we will see Eckler benefit more from is higher efficiency. I think we obviously he what led the league in touches and receptions and, and all this stuff, but he had like half the yards he had, you know, or he led in touchdowns, excuse me, but he, but he had, you know, half the receiving yards with all those receptions. Uh, his yards per carry were way, way down this year. And so I think we'll see his efficiency and his utilization at a smarter clip instead of just beating his body up and that will benefit him entirely. I think when we saw Zeke's production or not production, but his usage go down, everyone kind of questioned it. Like you're paying Zeke 17 million a year as a running back. And now you're giving him less carries to this guy named Tony Pollard. And it ended up, and Zeke's even talking, it ended up like benefiting Zeke because he wasn't just wearing his body out. They were splitting things and Zeke got so much more efficient. He was way better in the red zone. Any all fantasy owners out there know Zeke would get you 50 yards a game, but two touchdowns a game because of how they used him correctly in that format. And so I think we'll see that with Eckler in the sense that maybe not totality of yards and touchdowns go up or down, but his efficiency, I think, will go way up. And that also, in turn, will keep him healthy. And when you need him most down the stretch, then he's great. And a lot of that will do with what we talked about at the very beginning of the show is, do they draft a true number one running back? Do they lean truly on Isaiah Spiller or Joshua Kelly um, and what they do in that room? So I think that room will, will really benefit, too. And Eckler will see the reward in terms of efficiency. Yeah, Ryan, I think you said it best there. And it's not always about output. It's about yards per touch touchdowns per touch, first downs per touch, and just overall effectiveness. And so I think that Eckler's effectiveness will go up while the number of touches and the utilization rate will go down. And I think that's by design. And I think that's where we want to go. I think that most Chargers fans can agree that Eckler was overutilized in this system, catching way too many balls out of the backfield that were sort of empty, meaningless yards, these sort of three, four-yard plays that didn't really 
set you up for success and get the sequence of plays going that allows you to get rhythm and put a defense on its heel. So I'm really excited. I think Moore has landed in the perfect spot for him. I mean, my goodness, Ryan, if all of us could be unemployed the way Kellen Moore was unemployed. I mean, first of all, <laughs> less than 24 hours, he yep. gets an upgrade in terms of offensive talent at the skill positions. He gets to move to Los Angeles. I mean, my goodness, you know, uh, Kellen Moore is set a, is a beacon of, of light and a shining example of how people should think about all these tech layoffs in the economy, you know, in terms of upgrading his job in such a quick period of time. So good for Kellen Moore and even better for both the Bolt fam and, and Chargers Nation today. Yep. So I got two final points, and then also you have anything else, we can wrap up this edition of the LA Football Show. But one, 2022 Dallas Cowboys averaged 30.9 rushes per game. How many times, Jamal, have I been pounding the table? Just run the ball 30 times. Gives you a really damn good shot to win. So hopefully we will finally see that. At least 25 plus. I'm sure of that 30.9, I'm sure like two or three were Dak, Jamal. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't count for my metric. But uh, <laughs> in the quick research I did, that's what I came up with. So that is good. And two, and no idea what the contract is. Uh, no idea how much he's making. But just based on resume and based on name, the narrative of the Chargers being cheap, Although it's probably been true in a lot of instances, at least this hire, they did not go cheap with it and take, you know, a Gerard Johnson, an assistant QB coach, or a Zach Robinson from offensive mind one day over at the Rams. But they went with a name brand that everyone knows that probably is going to be, I'm sure, one of the higher paid offensive coordinators in football. So for this instance, the Chargers can buck that narrative and really say we just made a smart football move and the price didn't matter to us. So two uh, ending points on me, unless you got anything else. No, Ryan, I think you said it best. And I think we should be even more excited about the Chargers in 23. I think we were expecting a big jump in 22. We didn't quite get that jump that we were looking for. I think the stage is set now for 23. You're talking about Herbert going into year four. He's crossed 50 career starts just about. You've got now a top flight defensive mind, a top flight offensive mind, a top five wide receiving room, the touchdown leader in the NFL in your backfield. I mean, there's really no excuses now offensively for the Chargers. And then, oh, by the way, on that other side of the field, you've got James and Bosa and Mack and the others. This team needs to be an AFC title contender next year. And I think anything short of that would be a massive disappointment. We have to start thinking about the AFC as a big four of sorts. It's the Chiefs, it's the Bengals, it's the Bills and the Chargers. That's how they should be mm -hmm. thought of, not just next year, but for the foreseeable future of the next four to six years beyond that. Anything short of that is a massive disappointment. Totally. And, and no more great on paper. Like, go out and prove it on the field. And they made a great on paper hire now. Now let's see it in the results. And so good day for the Chargers, I think. Uh, a lot of good things. Let us know how you guys feel about this move. Uh, hit us up on Twitter at Ryan Dyer at LAFB, at LAFB Jams, or text us. You'll join our community for all our exclusive updates. Text the word BOLTS, that's B-O-L-T-S, to 31032. Join the conversation there. So let us know what you think. Thank you all, though, for tuning in. Uh, it's a good day, and we'll obviously have tons of off-season coverage all off-season long. We will be in Arizona on Radio Row here in just a couple weeks down in Phoenix. And, uh, you know, little birdie told me there's going to be some Chargers players down there, so we'll be sure to have some great interviews for you guys. Uh, so make sure to keep uh, following us, like, subscribe to the show wherever you listen, and uh, so you stay informed there. So. For Jamal Maddy, I'm Ryan Dyer. Everyone have a great evening, day, morning, whenever you're listening. And we'll talk to you all here in a couple days. You're listening to the LA Football Podcast.